by Sri Lanka's best internet package for online learning and online working with many amazing offers. Call 1212 for more information. Sri Lanka Telecom. Lenka, tu kuma wedi karaga ne? Lao ju rupyal panhata du kala. Mama, en api te ekak bom. Tonight, a true statesman. 15 years after the assassination of Foreign Minister Lakshman Kadirgamar, First at Nine looks back at the life of a remarkable Sri Lankan statesman. Accepting the inevitable, possible parliamentary speaker candidate Mahinda Yapa Bevardhana says he will accept the responsibility if given the chance. Promising signs. Sri Lanka's export earnings crossed the 1 billion US dollar mark for the first time this year, giving hope for better times. Familiar tones. UNP youth members disgruntled after new leadership hopes shattered by old promises. All that and much more coming up on First at Nine, this Saturday, the 15th of August, 2020. From Ada Verana, this is Ada Verana First at Nine. Nava Sunlight Sakura, then Dikukal Pavatina Sakura Mal Suandin. Live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to First at Nine. I'm Dhamdikate Mai. Now tonight we begin with a look back at the life and achievements of a true political and diplomatic giant, the late Foreign Minister Lakshman Khadirgamar. This week marked 15 years since the fateful day the late Foreign Minister Khadir Gamar, one of the most iconic politicians in Sri Lanka, was assassinated. Recognized as a true Sri Lankan, a patriot with a selfless desire to serve one's nation, respecting democracy, he strove to be an exemplary statesman. However, those same exemplary qualities were ultimately the reason that made him the prime target of the deadly terror group, the LTTE. Born in 1932 to a distinguished Tamil family, Lakshman Kadirgamar completed his secondary education at Trinity College, Kandy, where he excelled in academics and in a wide range of sports. In 1950, he studied law at the University of Ceylon and graduated with a Bachelor of Laws degree in 1953. He later entered Balliol College at Oxford University, where he became president of the Oxford Union in 1959, becoming one of the few Sri Lankans to hold the position. Prior to his eminent political career, Kadir Gamar also served as a consultant at the International Labour Organization in Geneva and as director of the Asia-Pacific region at the World Intellectual Property Organization. Kadir Gamar entered the world of politics at the age of 62 when he took over as the Minister of Foreign Affairs in 1994 when he was appointed by then President Chandrika Bandaranaika Kumarathunga. Kadir Gamar was an iconic figure throughout his political career whose presence, personality and policies improved Sri Lanka's standing on the international stage and raised Sri Lanka's profile during a controversial period of civil conflict. How do you feel as an ethnic Tamil yourself to yes. be so reviled by a group of Tamils? Well, that have I see it like this. At birth, I was given a label. If um, having been given that label, the LTT, nobody else, the LTT wants me to accept and approve everything that they do. The suicide bombers, the child soldiers, the uh, political assassinations, the extortion of, of order. But how people. does it make you feel you've got to I'm go around to that. I'm coming to that. You know, before I tell you what I feel, let me give you my rationale. Now, if being, if being opposed to all that makes me a traitor, which is what they call me sometimes, I am absolutely delighted to accept that appellation. I do it with pleasure. Despite being a Catholic, the late minister was instrumental in the adoption of the Vesak Day Resolution at the United Nations General Assembly on the 15th of December 1999. He also played a significant role in having the LTTE banned internationally, including by the United States and the United Kingdom, which helped deprive the terror outfit of their primary sources of funding. 
his steadfast campaigning on the global stage against the LTTE and his commitment to a united Sri Lanka ultimately made him one of the biggest targets of the terror group. The LTTE has conscripted thousands of teenage children to fight its war. Involving children as soldiers has been made easier by the proliferation of inexpensive light weapons. But the LTTE is committing more dastardly, more heinous crimes against Tamil children. It brazenly kidnaps them or lures them to its cause by glorifying and romanticizing war. Ultimately, on the night of 12th August 2005, Kadir Gamar paid the ultimate price when he was killed by a sniper bullet fired by an LTT deep cover operative while at his residence. Lakshman Kadir Gamar posthumously awarded the title of Sri Lanka Bhimanya, Sri Lanka's highest state honour by the government, for his noble contributions to the country. In 2005, almost 50 years after leaving the hallowed halls of Oxford University, Kadir Gamar's portrait was unveiled at the Oxford Union, a gesture of the honour and respect he commanded throughout his life. I would uh, like, if I may, to assume that I can share that honour with the people of Sri Lanka. Because I am very much a product of Sri Lanka. I had my schooling there, my first university was there, I went to the law college, and by the time I came to Oxford as a postgraduate student, well, I was a reasonably mature person. Oxford, I think, was the icing on the cake, but the cake was baked at home. <laughs> Now moving on with your local stories, there were more arrests of suspects linked to drug racketeering today as well. Among them are three suspects who had 73 million rupees in their bank accounts. Meanwhile, a drug racketeer known by the name Veyangode Hattaya was also taken into custody today. Three suspects were arrested in the area of Panadura today while in possession of over 1.7 million rupees. The arrests were made by the Paliagoda police. Police said four mobile phones, a laptop as well as passbooks of five bank accounts with funds amounting to 73 million rupees were also seized. The police added that the funds had come to the accounts within a year and 20 million rupees had been credited to during the period when the country was under lockdown owing to COVID-19. They added that the group of suspects had been orchestrated by a person living overseas. In the meantime, police have also apprehended the suspect known as Priyanta, alias Veyangoda Hattaya, who had operated a drug racket in the area of Veyangoda. Police said that the suspect was in possession of 5 grams of heroin and several cheques amounting to 9.8 million rupees of three private banks. They added that 70 million rupees had been transacted via the suspect's bank account in the recent times. Police have also seized the luxury vehicle the suspect was using at the time of the arrest and his luxury residences and vehicles believed to have been obtained with drug money are under investigation by police. The suspect is due to be detained and interrogated for seven days. In the meantime, a prison guard who had been involved in drug racketeering was arrested by the police anti-corruption unit of the Ratnapura division today. Police have taken 4.55 milligrams of heroin, two mobile phones and his official prison identity card. The suspect who was attached to the Valikada Riman prison is a resident of Madhuva of Ratnapura. Commissioner General of Prisons Tushar Upuldenia said that the suspect had been considered to have left the service since July. In a separate development, the Muadura housing scheme in Grand Pass was searched last evening with 518 police officers deployed for the operation. 870 houses had been searched during the operation, which has yielded 61 arrests. 39 grams of heroin, 85 grams of cannabis and 7 narcotic pills were found in the possession of suspects. <laughs> With speculation rife over who will take on the responsibility of controlling parliamentary proceedings for the next five years, possible candidate Mahindya Pabevardhana stated today that he is not averse to taking on the role if he is chosen by party consensus. He made these comments at a ceremony to felicitate his supporters who contributed to his victory at the general election. Mahinda Yapa Abhivardhana, who contested from the Matara district representing the Sri Lanka Pudujana Peramana, had organized a public gathering in the area of Panatiana in Valigama today. 
to thank his party members for his victory. Now, Prime Minister Mahindra Rajpaksha today participated in a ceremony to declare open the first permanent home for the Amarapura sect of Buddhism in the sect's 200-year history. Prime Minister Rajpaksha donated the land for the building back in 2011 during his term as president. The new Sangha Council building of the Amarapura sect, constructed in Vellabatta, was ceremonially declared open by Prime Minister Mahindra Rajpaksha today. The land for the building was donated nine years ago by the then President and current Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksa to construct the building for the Amarapura sect, which had not had a permanent building or address in its entire 200-year history. The three-story building, which will house all 22 chapters of the Amarapura sect, has been dedicated to Sir Cyril de Zoysa, an iconic figure who made great contributions to the Buddhist faith. <laughs> Memang nikahi Sangha Sabha ini yang setiap orang ini gelap di bawah negatif bawa bidang mau. Ini bagaimana memang orang ini gelap sendiri abu mungkin parit dia agak kiri mata, mata wasta wak lebih memilih bandar memang santun musuhin mau. Ini malah bad ini lah. Anda orang ini kalau urut kerana mata wasta wak lebih ni boleh halal tu lagi. Nanti api ada noa, penaya urut kerana. Bali memang tuan na hamdur uru, handu ini bela wak. We will see you once more after this break. Don't go away. Enjoy a very smooth shave with the Big Easy Two razor. Big Easy Two. Welcome back. You're watching First at Night. Now, leader of the United National Party, Ranil Vikram Singh, says that a new youth leader will be appointed through a mechanism that will be set up to face the forthcoming elections. Despite remarks made by Vikram Singh during a party meeting that was held today, some of the members of the UNP, however, are unsatisfied with the leader's promise. All those who had contested the general election under the ticket of the United National Party and lost were summoned to the party headquarters, Sirikota, today. During the meeting, Leader of the UNP, Ranil Vikramasinghe, said that a new mechanism consisting of youth will be set up to face the forthcoming provincial council elections while continuing party activities. He had added that a youth leader will be appointed via the mechanism after the provincial council elections. <laughs> Moving on with other local stories, the government's repatriation efforts are in full swing, with 590 Sri Lankans being flown back to the island during yesterday and today. 
Now, among those who were repatriated are 10 returnees from China, 296 returnees from Oman, 246 from Lebanon, 40 returnees from the United Arab Emirates, while the remaining six are from Kuwait. All the returnees were subjected to PCR tests and were subsequently directed for quarantine. Meanwhile, three fresh COVID-19 cases were detected in the island today. This puts the country's number of active coronavirus cases at 212. The overall number of COVID-19 recoveries, meanwhile, stand at 2,666. Now, the state intelligence service had known that Easter Sunday attacks ringleader Zaran Hashim and his cohort had the all-round capability of launching an attack, as they did, even before foreign intelligence reached the island. This was conceded by former chief of the SIS, Nilanta Jayavardhan himself, while giving evidence before the Presidential Commission of Inquiry probing the attacks. Former chief of the State Intelligence Service, Nilanta Jayavardhan, gave evidence before the Presidential Commission of Inquiry for the 11th day yesterday. The additional Solicitor General representing the Commission asked Jayavardhan as to how the officials were manoeuvred upon receiving foreign intelligence. The witness said that by the time foreign intel was received, he was already aware that technical equipment of the attacks ringleader Zaran Hashim, who was abroad following the Mawanala attack, were being operated. He added that despite closely following the matter, reports from relevant units were not forthcoming. Furthermore, the witness noted that the information on Zaran, possessed by the Army Intelligence, was given following the conclusion of the Intelligence Review meeting held on the 19th of March in 2019, and it informed that Zaran is out of the country. When the Commission questioned Javardana whether he believed it, the answer was that there was no reason to accept it. The Commission also asked the witness whether he considered the intel given by a foreign intelligence agency on the 4th of April to be true. The former SIS chief responded saying that an assessment on the probability was done. When the Commission further questioned the witness as to whether he was aware of Zaran and his cohort's capability to carry out such an attack, Javardana replied that he knew of the group's mental capacity to perpetrate such an attack and not the practical capacity. He went on to say that he was unaware of the terrorist's practical capability even after explosives were found in Vanatha Vilduva. However, the Commission continuously questioned the former SIS head as to whether he was aware of the terrorist's physical capability to carry out an attack by the time foreign intelligence was received. The witness's answer was that he did know of the terrorist's physical capacity to conduct an attack. The Commission then asked the witness as to what was the need to investigate further even after information was passed on on the 4th of April in 2019. Former Chief of the State Intelligence Service Nilanth Jayavardhana responded saying that he forwarded that piece of intel to his officers and called for a report. Once he received the report the next day, Jayavardhana said that he dispatched SIS officers to the relevant areas on the same day. The witness said that after dispatched officers submitted a preliminary investigation report, he brought the IGP up to speed on the matter and by the 7th of April, the National Intelligence Chief and the Defence Secretary were also briefed. An underprivileged youth from Mirissa has reportedly been physically tortured for a period of 48 days at sea at the hands of his fellow crewmen aboard a multi-day fishing vessel. Shehan Pramod, a youth who ventured out on his first trip to sea in search of a better life for his parents and his four siblings, was forced to endure levels of inhuman torture for the simple reason of having accidentally dropped a fish back into the sea. The 48 days of torture have turned a healthy young man into a relative invalid and caused immense emotional trauma to a family that have received no justice as yet. Shehan Pramod, a youth from Mirissa in Matra, first went out to sea on the 28th of June. The reason for the young man to venture out to sea aboard a deep-sea fishing trawler for the first time was due to his family situation. With five young children to feed in a family that lives in extreme poverty, Shehan was the family's only hope for a source of income and hope for a better future. However, little did Shehan know that what promised to be a route to a better life for him and his family members would ultimately lead to 48 days of inhuman treatment from his fellow crew members. A hale and hearty young man at the beginning of his journey to sea, Shehan arrived back on show almost two months later, a relative invalid. The reason Shehan gives for his inhuman treatment was his having dropped a large fish back into the sea when pulling in the day's catch. Shehan also revealed to his parents that he endured a daily torrent of physical abuse from the older crewmen of the boat since that incident. <laughs> But again, 
चॉकलेट बिस्किट टैक करके ना खाने की ये ला एक आधा दूर के ना लूट नया मिलने का हाला मिट्टी वाली इंगा हाला माधु दल वाली इंगा हाला अंग पता सेहर में तू हाला दालती है ना बोर्ड फिर ये आउ दो वाली इंगे हिमा हालती है ना मोहतरा रंगे ला कॉन्डेज का पला मापी किया नहीं मार्ट सुहाने आकला बाद इन दारों के कोंदे वाटे फेला सेहरो म कैडिला दी है ना वाह एक रा प्लेट का दाग अन्नो है ना अब टेक वक्त का जान हाल टेवाज का मारने मग महात्य कुली वाटे का रान्ने मर दारु पास्ते ने किन ना वाह अब इरता आम नहीं थी है माका क्रिया मार गया कब इरता आम हम बोलने However, after our news report this afternoon, the boat owner had visited Shyam's residence and given the family twenty-five thousand rupees towards his medical treatment. Meanwhile, police say that the suspects responsible for this dastardly act have since fled the area. We will see you shortly, bear with us. Salem Bank, the bank with a heart. Welcome back to First at Night. Now, the Export Development Board today reported the first signs of recovery within the country's export sector hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. Export earnings for July passed the one billion US dollar mark for the first time since January this year, giving the sector hope for better times in the year ahead. Sri Lanka's exports have surpassed the one billion dollar mark in July for the first time since January this year. Earnings from merchandise exports recorded a double-digit growth rate of 11.31% in July 2020 to $1.09 billion compared to July 2019. What's more, July 2020 earnings from merchandise exports increased by 20.3% compared with June. The Export Development Board says that the strong performance is consistent with the gradual lifting of COVID-19 restrictions locally and internationally. The EU region accounted for 21.17% of the increase, while South Asia and the Middle East accounted for 11.47% and 8.91% respectively in July 2020, compared to July 2019. The United States, the largest single export destination, accounted for 256.09 million dollars in exports in July 2020, a 5.67 increase in comparison to 242.36 million US dollars in June 2020. In the meantime, July tea export earnings, which made up 12% of total merchandise exports, increased by 17.63% year on year to 130.93 million US dollars, with export volumes also increasing by 11.24% during the month. The increase was mainly attributed to high demand for Ceylon tea from Turkey and Russia. Meanwhile, export earnings from spices and essential oils also increased significantly in July 2020 year on year, with cinnamon up by 63.6% and pepper up by 46.3%. Earnings from apparel and textiles and rubber and rubber-based products grew significantly during July 2020, owing to higher demand for personal protective equipment. PPE-related export earnings were recorded at 115.1 million US dollars in July 2020. Meanwhile, export earnings from apparel and textiles increased by 16.16% to 467.04 million US dollars in July, compared with 402.04 million US dollars in June 2020. However, a 1.37% year-on-year decline was recorded for the month. In the meantime, the top five export destinations during the January to July 2020 period were the United States, which accounted for 1.403 billion US dollars of exports. And the UK, which accounted for 461.7 million US dollars, exports to India were recorded at 339.4 million US dollars during the same period, while Germany recorded 312.6 million US dollars and Italy 233.5 million US dollars. In addition, exports to the EU region recorded an increase of 21.67 percent to 356.64 million US dollars in July 2020. Meanwhile, exports to the UK as the largest trading partner in the EU region. Recorded an increase of 18.66 percent to 100.1 million dollars in July 2020, compared to the previous year. The S&P 500 ended nearly flat yesterday, despite coming close again to its record closing high as data on the U.S. economy added to uncertainty over the recovery. The benchmark index at one point was up 0.15 percent to 3,378.15, but closed marginally lower. On Wednesday and Thursday, the S&P 500 briefly traded above its February 19 record close of 3,386.15, but lacked momentum yesterday. According to data from yesterday, U.S. retail sales increased less than expected last month and could slow further due to spiraling COVID-19 cases and a reduction in unemployment benefit checks. 
Separately, readings showed that U.S. factory output increased more than expected in July, but remained below pre-pandemic levels, while consumer sentiment was largely steady in the first half of August. The Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 0.12% to 27,931.02. The S&P 500 lost 0.02% to 3,372.85. And the Nasdaq Composite dropped by 0.21% to 11,019.30. For the week, however, the S&P 500 rose 0.6%. The Dow added 1.8%, while the Nasdaq gained 0.1%. In the meantime, oil prices edged lower yesterday on worries that demand would recover more slowly than expected from the COVID-19 pandemic lockdowns, while the rising supply also overshadowed optimism over falling crude and fuel in inventories. Now, this week, two prominent forecasters, the International Energy Agency and the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, trimmed their 2020 oil demand forecasts. Brent crude settled at $44.80 a barrel, falling 16 cents, while U.S. West Texas Intermediate settled at $42.01 a barrel, down 23 cents. For the week, Brent was up 0.9% and WTI gained 1.9%. Oil has recovered from lows touched in April when WTI briefly turned negative. Still, a rise in the number of novel coronavirus infections has limited gains. OPEC Plus has cut output since May by around 10% of pre-pandemic global demand to support the market. Now, the Derana Dialogue Prashansa 60 Plus Season 3 finals are set to be held tomorrow night to choose who will reign as the country's best senior citizen entertainer this year. Has been, uh, which has seen rather hundreds of participants all over the age of 60, has garnered much public anticipation to see which of the finalists will prevail. Viewers can look forward to an exciting and glittering program tomorrow where they can watch and participate in choosing their pick for the big prize. And that's it from all of us here at First at Nine. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.